gave the father of the bride speech, I thought that I might do something to record it while I gave it, but I didn't. Um, but I thought you might like it recorded anyway, just for pos posterity. So here goes. Good afternoon. I'm James, and from the fact that I'm about to give the father of the bride speech, I suspect that you can guess my relationship to Abby and Alan. There comes a time in life when certain aspects of a body start to become unreliable and can benefit from a little technological assistance. In my case, it's both my eyes and my memory that have the potential to let me down, hence my use of the teleprompter to help me. But the technology needs the 21st century equivalent of page terming, and so I asked my wife Susan to take control and help me. Many years ago, Susan was the page turner for Arthur Rubinstein when he recorded the Schubert piano trios in Geneva's Victoria Concert Hall. She is thus ludicrously overqualified for the current task. On the other hand, it says much for my new age man credentials that at such an important time in my life, I am willing to hand the control of the remote to my wife. A couple of months ago, Lou, David's fiancé, came round to our house and was telling us how many weddings she had to go to this year. It's a phenomenon that happens at a certain time in your life, recognised in the title of a famous Hugh Grant movie. A few weeks after that, Sheila, of his mum, and Susan and I were driving to the funeral of my uncle when Sheila remarked that at our time of life it's more like four funerals and a wedding. So I'd like to begin today by profoundly thanking Abby and Alan for finding each other, falling in love and deciding to get married on this truly joyous occasion. It's certainly making this old man very happy indeed. In 1930, novelist Agatha Christie married archaeologist Max Mellowan saying, I married an archaeologist because the older I grow, the more interested in me he becomes. Eighty-three years later, hotel manager Abby Hardiman has had an even better idea. By choosing an expert sommelier at the top of his career, she knows that she has someone who appreciates the fine qualities that come from a good vintage, but who also knows that nurture and care is necessary to achieve the best results. All I ask, Alan Holmes, is that you don't store her on her side, on a wooden rack in a dark and cool room, and that you realise that she's more of a drink-deep sort of girl than sip and spit. My task today is to welcome our guests, particularly Alan's parents, John and Eunice, and his brothers and their wives and partners, Anthony and Janet and Brian and Lynn, and we miss John and Sue. Thank you for making that long trek down from Lancashire, and thank you so much for bringing your son, Alan, into the world to give such love and joy to our daughter, Abby. And of course, thank you to all of Abby's and Alan's other family and friends who've come to help them and us celebrate this special day, especially Abby's grandma Dory, who has overcome considerable disability and who has also travelled quite a way to be with us today. And most especially, I'd like to thank the handsome Cameron and the absolutely enchanting Caitlin for being such an excellent best man and bridesmaid. It's wonderful to have you all here and I'd also like to remember some of our family who didn't make it this far, but who would certainly have been delighted to see Abby so happy. In particular, Abby's maternal grandfather, who sadly died earlier this year, is in my mind. When I married Abby's mum, Sheila, several lifetimes ago, he took me on one side and gave me some advice that Alan probably already knows. Remember, my boy, he said, that you hold a woman by the waist and a wine bottle by the neck and it's important not to get the two confused. I have found that his advice has stood me in good stead over the years, despite times when I was tempted to disobey it. I also want to remember our Auntie May, much loved by everyone in her family, who died very recently. And I know that my parents, particularly my mum, Abby's Grandma Daisy, would have been so excited to be here. It may be, John and Eunice, that your family is also missing one or two guests at the feast, so let's all take a brief moment to drink to absent friends. Absent friends. 
John and Eunice, you may be wondering who it is that your son is marrying and what sort of family is now being hitched alongside yours. If you were hoping for royalty or even aristocracy, I'm afraid you will be disappointed. But Abby is nevertheless from a particularly fine appellation. I traced the Hardiman family back, hoping to find aristocracy or at least great wealth. But by the time I got back to 1709 and Abby's sixth great-grandmother, the splendidly named Averina Forward, I realised that we hardy men are not only, as my mother would have said, not aristocratic, we're not even yeomen. We have to face it, the hardy men were solid English peasant stock. But they seem to be, as far as I can tell, good people, and the only remaining hardy men, Abby and her brother David, are delightful, kind and loving people, hard-working and with great integrity, worthy inheritors of that Hardiman tradition. And that is why I was delighted that Abby decided to keep her name, not in any rejection of the name Holmes, but because she is proud of the name Hardiman. And we are proud that she has chosen such a good man to be with. Welcome, Alan, to Clan Hardiman. So that's a little about the vintage of the woman, but what about her character? Born and brought up in cooler climes, she's probably more of a white wine than a red, but is not thin and acid like one or two of her ancestors, but full-bodied, balanced, with a complex character and an excellent finish. Whether it's appropriate for her father to suggest that she's fruity seems doubtful, so I'll just go with mellow. If I stayed with the wine metaphors, I might strain to describing her nose, which feels like dodgy ground for a father, so I think I'll just leave that there. When preparing this oratory, I spent some time on the internet looking for ideas and jokes. The jokes were all, without fail, awful. Not funny and awful, just awful. But there were one or two good bits of advice, one of which has stuck with me. It said, be careful about which funny anecdotes from your daughter's childhood you choose to relate. You can tell me when I've done whether you feel that I successfully heeded that advice. Is she looking nervous? I'm remembering a time when Abby must have been around four or five years old. She and I were sitting in the garden at Hook Road, just outside the Wendy house that my father had made. I expect that her school friends here will today remember that Wendy house. Abby was sitting on my lap and I culled her up and asked her, Are you Daddy's little girl? She looked up at me and replied seriously, No, I am my own person. And so she is. She had the courage then and has had continued to have the emotional courage to always speak her truth. If you've known Abby for any time, I'm sure you will have witnessed occasions when, despite floods of tears, she was cutting through an emotional mess that had built up in some situation. Abby has a laser-like emotional integrity, which can feel pretty uncomfortable at the time, but which usually turns out to resolve the situation and to be a relief to all concerned. I still remember Abby in her teens, again in floods of tears, telling my father some much-needed home truths while he sat in his chair with mouth agape, and I was thinking, way to go, kid, while preparing to get up and run. But he took it on board. And so it was, more than ten years after the My Own Person incident, when Abby came to me at a time when the relationship between her mother and me was particularly strained, and said, look, David and I have friends whose parents are happily married, and friends whose parents are divorced, but we don't have any friends with parents like you two. Sort it out. I think it's thanks to that emotional courage of Abby's that Sheila and I did sort it out, and today are able to be friends, happy to be here to see our lovely daughter married. So, if I have any advice for the two of you from my own chequered relationship experience, it is, whatever else happens, remain friends. And don't let bad things build up. But then I know that Abby wouldn't let that happen. 
It's interesting that Abby is marrying a man for whom the imbibing of spirituous beverages is such an integral part of his life. I remember Abby going to her first teenage party. At about 9pm we got a phone call from a weeping daughter. Daddy, she cried, they're all getting drunk and I don't like it. Will you come and pick me up? My heart swelled with pride at raising such a responsible child. Maybe five years after that, Abby graduated from Southampton University and got herself a job with a sailing and holiday club in Greece. David and I were running a little IT company at the time and decided to take advantage of Abby's employer's friends and family scheme. We flew off to Greece for some time in the sun. It was while we were there that I realised that Abby's objection to the demon drink had not persisted when her young friends and colleagues in the club told us, when she wasn't listening, and with hushed awe in their voices, how Abby could lead the group in, what shall we say, spirited drinking games? So I am relieved that now she's settling down, it's with a man who, if she does decide to overindulge, would at least ensure that it's on good quality stuff. And that will you pick me up phone call wasn't the last, or even the most memorable. There was the phone call one Christmas. Hello Mummy and Daddy, I'm in hospital on the Falkland Islands. And it can't be many fathers who get a phone call saying, will you give me a lift from my current job to my next job? Now, you might think that unremarkable, but she was at the time in Innsbruck and the next job was in Brittany. That was a 3,000 mile round trip in the Citroen Zantia. It was more than 40 years ago when I made an appointment with my then bank manager, Sheila's father, and asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. Even back then, I thought I was being a bit old-fashioned, but Sheila's dad appreciated such things. So I was surprised and delighted, having become a bit of an old-fashioned fogey myself, when I got a text from Alan asking if I would be home on a certain day and could he pop round. He arrived the next day to ask me for my daughter's hand in marriage. Don't hold back, young man, I said. Take the whole woman. Alan explained that I shouldn't interpret this in the sexist way of asking for transfer of ownership of this woman. Well, remembering Abby's declaration of self-ownership at age five, I thought, good luck with that. No, he explained, he had come because he knew how important family is to Abby and how important Abby is to her family and he wanted to ensure that he had everyone's blessing before asking her to marry him. A man who is a careful planner and who likes to get all his ducks in a row before embarking on a major project. What's not to like about that? And he's right, family is important to Abby and she is important to us. We are already starting to get a picture of Alan. He's a man who appreciates having a shed or two in his life, and apparently a greenhouse. A man who can acquire a wheelbarrow for free when the need arises. And he's a man who orders compost by the lorry load. He seems to me to be the ideal sort of chap for my daughter, and I wish them both a lifetime of happiness. Having started with an Agatha Christie quote, I thought I'd also finish with one by way of my advice to two young people setting out on a life together. It is a curious thought, but it is only when you see people looking ridiculous that you realise just how much you love them. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to suggest that we all be upstanding, charge our glasses and drink to the health and happiness of the bride and groom. Abby and Alan.